Uh, thank you so much for being here, Ron, and you can go ahead and start. Great, thank you very much. Um, so it is, uh, pardon me here. Okay, uh, so for anyone here in the, the great state of California, good morning. Uh, my name is Ron Nearing, and I am the Director of International Programs at the Leadership Institute. Uh, and uh, prior to that, I've done about 32 years worth of uh, uh, activity on the conservative side and the, and the Republican side in, in the United States. The best job I probably had in politics during that time was in 2016. I served as the presidential campaign spokesman uh, for Senator Ted Cruz in the presidential campaign, which was uh, uh, pretty terrific. And, uh, and I'm going to share with you today, uh, we're going to go over some media training for communicators. And this can be if you're in a public policy capacity or if you're uh, a candidate for office or speaking on behalf of a candidate or an ally or a surrogate or in any number of capacities where you're going to be dealing with the news media, making presentations that are covered by the news media as well as one-on-one uh, -on -one or panel interviews uh, as well so let's go through this we're going to take uh, you know through the top of the hour uh, and uh, and have the time to uh, hopefully answer some questions uh, as well uh, what I want to start with here is you know, why do we do media training in the first place because there are some people who have you know a different ideas to as to what they think media training is from what uh, from what reality is and number one it's about reaching for every opportunity that we have. Uh, and uh, very often, you know, nowadays, you know, with the relentless bashing on the so-called fake news and the like, we work with the news media because we need to uh, in order to reach a wider audience uh, for our ideas. Um, getting on, if you're on uh, CNN in the United States or in prime time, you're talking to a million people. And even if half of those people uh, automatically dismiss whatever it is you say, you're still reaching half a million people at virtually no cost. So it's about reaching for every opportunity uh, and maximizing every interaction that we have with the reporter. Um, that's really what it's about. Uh, and doing so, being well prepared, gives you confidence. And really, when you're communicating with a reporter and, the, and uh, they can see if you're confident about what you're talking about, and the audience, if you're communicating through television or video, the audience can see if you're confident in your topic uh, and your subject matter uh, as well. There are a couple of things which media training uh, is not. Uh, one of them is that it's not simply uh, spinning. Um, uh, and, and people who are kind of new to politics very often will not grasp exactly what spinning is. Uh, and spinning is not lying, it's not misleading, it's not dodging, but rather it's helping a situation to be seen correctly and in the best light possible of course, particularly when you're dealing with crisis communications. Um, I wanted to put this up here because in a, at least in a political campaign, in a political context, uh, I wanted to drop in where does working with the media fall in what we call the pathway to victory. In political campaigns, we often talk about a pathway to victory. How do we get to win? How do we get from where we are now to where we need to be? And I've outlined that on this on this slide that you see before you right now. On the left side, we have where are the voters now? Where are the voters at the beginning of the campaign? And this is informed by our initial research. What's the voter mood and the priority at the very beginning of the campaign before anyone starts uh, any campaigning at all? From there we go to what do we have to work with? We know where people are presently, but what are we gonna have to work with? And that's influenced by our candidate, the opposition, how is our political party viewed? How is our movement viewed, uh, et cetera? What are voters' pre-existing conceptions? Or if we're not talking about an election, what are the pre-existing conceptions, uh, conceptions of, uh, of our target audience, of who we have to persuade, whether that's voters, constituents, elected officials, opinion leaders, uh, and the like. I have vulnerability assessments listed here because in a political context, vulnerability assessments are when we research ourselves as well as the opposition to determine where are we vulnerable? What, what are the likely areas which we have to shore up? Where can we anticipate our opponents' attacks coming in? And then finally, what are, what are voters feeling about us, about our opponent, et cetera? Not just their general mood and priorities, but where do voters start thinking about our candidate or our issues. On the far right side of the screen, we have where do we need the voters to be or where, where do we need 
our target audience to be. Uh, and that, that is assessed in terms of vote goals or what our winning coalition looks like, what we want people thinking about when they have to make a decision. So if we're working on influencing elected officials on a vote on a matter at a city council or a state legislature, et cetera, then what do we need those elected officials thinking about when they make their decision as opposed to voters on election day? What do we need them thinking about? Do we want them thinking about health care? Do we want them thinking about taxes? What do we want them thinking about? And then right there that connects all of this together is how do we get them there? And that's really where strategic communications comes into play, or working with the news media, using the news media in order to advance our agenda. This is where it comes into play. Uh, part of that is that any campaign, either whether it's on an issue or an elect, uh, for an elected office or, or uh, uh, an educational campaign, there needs to be a command focus. What is it that this campaign is about? What is at stake? And that's something that needs to be understood very clearly internally within the organization or within the campaign. And then it's something we communicate externally uh, to the wider audience. But everyone should be very clear on what that uh, is all about. And then there are a couple of strategic communications imperatives, at least in a political campaign, that become very, very uh, important. One of them is defining our candidate. Um, the second is adding support. And what I mean, how this is different is that when you first define a candidate, that's going to get you a certain, a certain uh, uh, distance toward the goal. But usually, a candidate's own personal brand is not enough to get to victory. It gets you part of the way, but not all the way. And so therefore, during the campaign, we have to add in layers of support from people who we identify, groups of people we identify, uh, maybe it's suburban women whose support we need to earn. Maybe it's people from the south side of town uh, or people who, uh, you know, who are in the, in the energy sector. And we target, the, the campaign will target those people to persuade them and bring them over to add them uh, as uh, like layers to the cake. Then there's defining the opponent, not attacking the opponent, but defining the opponent. This has an asterisk because in a, in a campaign that is non-competitive, uh, where you're 30 points ahead and, and it's three days to, to the election, chances are you won't mention your opponent at, at all. Uh, but in competitive races, there's always a need to define the opponent. And of course, the opponent is working hard to define you. And then finally, there's mobilization. And that is a completely different, although related, strategic communications objective where you're taking people who have been persuaded to support you and then working to mobilize them to make sure that they turn out, uh, that they turn out uh, and vote. In any campaign, there will be other strategic communications imperatives, but these four, in addition to the command focus, are very common in a political context. If you're working on an issue campaign, then you'll have different strategic communications imperatives, which should be lined, uh, outlined and well understood by anyone who will be communicating with the news media. Uh, and we work with the news media for, uh, for three main reasons. Number one is that in many campaigns, whether it's educational, lobbying campaign, or a political campaign, that we need to use the news media in order to reach that wider audience. To reach people any other way uh, can be extremely cost prohibitive or expensive. Campaigns spend millions of dollars on television ads and so on, but if you think about it, when I was uh, spokesman for Senator Cruz, if I could be on even MSNBC in the middle of the day, we're still talking to 100,000 people. How much would it cost us to communicate with 100,000 people for some period of time? That's a lot of money, especially if it's mail or even automated calls, et cetera. So we work with the news media because we have to. Number two, chances are our opponents are doing the same. And that's true of issue campaigns as well as in uh, political campaigns for candidates. And number three, uh, in many cases, the media is going to cover your campaign or they're going to cover your issue whether you like it or not. And therefore, we may as well be in the game to influence that to some degree. So this is why we have to work you know, with, the, with the news media. When we do, we really have two key things that we need to, to do every time we communicate with the press. Number one is to advance the strategic communications objectives of the campaign. That if we're, not, if we're talking to a reporter and it does not serve the campaign's interests at all, then we really, do we really need to do it? Now, sometimes the answer is yes. But we need to evaluate that. This is part of the reason why 
in a uh, serious political campaign, the last people who uh, a campaign wants to bother talking to is reporters from a foreign country. Uh, and very often, in a, I'll give you an example from the U.S. Uh, political, US context. During Senator Cruz's re-election campaign in 2018, uh, we had a reporter from a French news agency who kept you know, showing up at campaign events, and he was doing his job. He was covering the U.S. midterm elections, but we really didn't have any interest in talking to the guy uh, because th there weren't any voters in France who were going to affect uh, the outcome of the election of a Texas Senate race. And so did that advance our objectives? No, we had other things that were far more important than talking to the French guy. Uh, but number two is avoiding generating distractions for the campaign. And unfortunately, nowadays, elected officials, candidates, people involved in public policy are very, are, can easily fall into this trap of either having an interaction with a reporter turn into a negative or to do things, particularly in social media, that wind up getting, getting them in trouble uh, uh, down the line. So we want to make sure that we're paying attention to these two objectives, that we're advancing some strategic communications objective that we've defined, and that we are avoiding generating distractions. And at the very end of this presentation, I'm going to give you three examples, all from conservatives who, uh, who were damaged uh, and generated their own uh, distractions. So let's get into the, a little bit of the mechanics of doing an interview or a presentation. And first, we have to keep in mind, what is the listener looking for? And we have to understand that because otherwise, if we're not providing value, uh, then out comes this, right? If we're sitting there giving a talk and people are bored, out comes the phone. Uh, and so people are very easily distracted. So people are looking for value. Uh, and you have to be sure that when you're communicating to any audience that you are providing something of value. Uh, and that really is fed by three components. Number one is credibility. Number two is to be interesting. That number three is to be respectful. Let me take those in reverse order. What I mean by being respectful is that if you appear on uh, on a on a television show or a radio show that's live, for instance, people are tuning into that show not because of you, because you were the, the usually the audience doesn't even know who's going to be on the show in advance. People are tuning into that show because of the host. And so if you go on to a program and argue with the host and get into a fight with the host, chances are you're gonna be offending uh, those viewers who are actually you want to ultimately influence. So being respectful uh, is important and being worthy of respect uh, is important. Number two is to be interesting. And very often in politics, we're talking about dry, boring topics in which case we have to find interesting ways to talk about them. Uh, very often that means wind, uh, winding it up with a story, uh, sharing a story about a person and not just a policy. So that can be, a, that's an important component. And then finally, there's being credible and preserving one's own credibility, both generally and when interacting with, with reporters is vitally important. You should never lie to a reporter. You should never deliberately mislead a reporter. Uh, because those things harm your credibility as a communicator. And then it, naturally, if the reporter gets burned, uh, that's going to impact uh, their likelihood of using uh, you as a source in the future. And all three of these things are intuitive judgments. And people will make these judgments based in large part on three factors, the visual, the vocal, and the verbal. Now, take a look at these numbers. 55% of how a person uh, judges us uh, and draw and influence their perception is from the visual, what they see. That's part of the reason why you know, I'm wearing a jacket and a tie today, because it has an impact on, on perception. Uh, there's the vocal, and the vocal is not what is said, but it's how it's said. Tone of voice, inflection, and what that says about the person and the topic can be extremely influential with an audience. And so that's why, that's part of the reason why reading a speech, you know, if I come out with, you know, some speech here, and I'm going to read, you know, read this word for word, what's going to happen to my vocals? Chances are my vocals are going to become very monotone. I'm going to tend to speak at a single pace. I'm not going to emphasize words for, uh, for effect. Uh, and uh, when, and I've got a slide toward the end about vocals, but 
when, particularly when the audience doesn't know you already and they're forming a judgment about you, much of that will be influenced by how you speak. Do you come across as a jackass or do you come across as a reasonable person who should be paid attention to? All of that is heavily influenced by the vocals. And then finally, there's the verbal. Those are the actual words uh, that are used. And I think part of the reason why people in academia uh, are very, not all of them, but very often people in academia are not really great speakers because they're used to having a captive audience. Uh, you want to pass my class? Well, then you better come and listen to my lecture. But when you're dealing in a competitive environment where someone can change a channel, where someone can uh, to turn to a different station on the radio, uh, then it requires all of these other skills in both the visual uh, and, uh, and the vocal. I really want to recommend this book to you. Uh, it, you know, we're, we've all seem to have extra time at home. Uh, and it, this is a perfect time to upgrade your skills. That's why it's great that you're part of this presentation today. Uh, but there are other things that you can do to improve your skills. And I promise you that if you read this book uh, by Jack Schaefer called The Like Switch, Jack Schaefer is a former FBI behavioral psychologist. Uh, and he goes through all of the nonverbal signals that we send to people that can either drive them away from us or bring them toward us. So this is a really, really great reading. I highly recommend it. So if we're gonna get ready uh, for a presentation or for an interview, there are a couple of uh, skills that, that you will benefit from and techniques that you can use in order to really be prepared so that you have the confidence to really make the most out of that presentation or that interview. The first is what we call the four framing questions. And we call them the framing questions because these are not questions that we directly address in our presentation, but rather these are things we keep in mind as we're putting our presentation together, as we're formulating. What are the things that I want to get across in this interview? What are the things I want to, I want to make sure the audience walks away with? So those are answered by these four questions. And the first is, who am I talking to? Who is my target audience? Now that might be uh, initially, for people who are kind of new to this, you might think, well, obviously, it's the people in the room, or it's the people watching television, or the people listening to the radio show. That's not necessarily true. It's more likely that it's some subset of those people. And let me give you an example. Uh, during the Cruz presidential campaign, we had an active debate during the campaign on whether or not uh, I should appear on MSNBC uh, at all. And for those of you who are not in the United States, MSNBC is a uh, typically uh, seen as a left-leaning uh, cable program. All their evening program uh, hosts are all you know left-wingers. There are no conservative hosts there, uh, and uh, and so you know we debated: is this even worthwhile? And the answer quickly that we arrived to was yes, it is, because 30% of the people who watch MSNBC are Republicans. And we were in a Republican primary contest. We wanted to reach Republican voters and influence them. So literally, when I would appear on MSNBC, and let's say in prime time, talking to 1 million people, we weren't primarily concerned about the 700,000 non-Republicans who were watching. We were speaking to the 300,000 Republicans who were watching. That was our target audience. And so therefore, uh, the messaging was aimed at them. And they, of course, had different beliefs on issues and politics and outlook toward Washington than the non-Republicans watching. So actually appearing on MSNBC was a big plus because every time the host would ask a question, it always came from a left-wing perspective. Of course, we predicted that. And then we would just respond with a good, solid answer that showed how conservative our candidate was. So it actually worked very well for us. Second framing question is, what do I want them to do? What is the call to action? If we persuade the audience successfully, what is it that we want them to do? Do they want them to donate? Do we want them to call their legislator on something? Do we want them to uh, volunteer for the campaign, to vote for our candidate, to not vote for our opponent? What is the call to action? What do we want them to do? Number three is, what are the alternatives? If people don't do what I want them to do, what else could they do? Uh, and that's important to understand so that you can frame your argument and bearing that uh, in mind. And then number four is what's the relative context? What's happening now that we need to be sensitive uh, to with the target audience? Is there some subject we need to bring up? Is there a subject we need to avoid? Is there a certain way that we should talk about uh, these issues? Are there are we campaigning for president and we're in South Carolina and there's a particular issue that we need to be able to talk about uh, or to avoid? Having that type of 
contacts and knowing your audience uh, is, uh, is vitally important. So all of these taken in context, if you think through before you do an interview and you think through the answers to all four of these questions, you're going to have a more successful time because you're going to be clear on who you're talking to, what you want them to do. You're going to bear in mind what the alternatives are and the relevant context. Next, have you ever noticed how our friends on the left are always tagging us as being anti? Have you noticed this? Um, that conservatives or libertarians are uh, anti-woman, anti-minorities, anti-African-American, anti-poor people, anti-elderly, anti-young people, anti-women, anti-environment, anti-science. It's always anti, anti, anti. And there's a reason for this. And the reason is that it works in that it's better to be on the pro side of an argument than, an anti, uh, than the anti side generally. And so the reason why our opponents are taking that label of anti and always looking to attach that to us is because it's to their advantage to do so. So we have to be prepared to define ourselves by what we are for just as much, if not more, than by what we are against. If you're on the pro side of an argument, it's pretty easy. I'm for this. But if you get caught being on the anti side of the argument, you are, number one, you're in the negative, right? You're against, you're framing your, your, uh, your comments negatively, which can turn off an audience that may be new to an issue. And you have to explain, make sure that the audience knows and fully understands what you're against, in addition to then knowing what you're for. And that can take up bandwidth and having to explain that, particularly when it's a nuanced issue or a technical uh, issue. So always look for that opportunity to define yourself by what you are for and what you are advocating for. And, and you should resist at every opportunity being boxed in by your opponent and being pushed into the anti side uh, of, uh, of an argument. This doesn't mean, for example, that you cannot be defined as being against an unpopular tax. That's understandable. There was a proposed beer tax in London. That was a dumb idea. Uh, and the, the anti-campaign was very well defined as, you know, we're anti, you know, the beer tax or the pub tax or whatever it was called. Uh, that's okay. But in general terms, we want to define ourselves by what we are for rather than what we are against. We are for individual liberty and freedom. We are not just against big, obnoxious uh, government. Um, in, in, Many political campaigns, I've seen uh, people put together uh, a myth versus fact sheet. You might have seen these before where someone goes through and they write up a document where they say, the myth is this, and then they describe them, whatever the accusation is, but the facts are this, and then myth, fact, myth, fact, myth, fact. And I want you to never do that. And the reason why I want you to never do that is that you should never repeat your opponent's arguments in any type of uh, uh, political debate or campaign, et cetera. You have a limited amount of bandwidth. Do not waste your bandwidth by repeating your opponent's arguments, by using their vocabulary, et cetera. Always use the vocabulary that you choose. And I'm gonna show you a technique for doing that in just a moment. But whenever I see a myth versus fact sheet for a call that's put out by a side that I agree with, I just go through the roof because they are, they are in effect, making sure that everyone hears what all the criticisms are. And what happens when someone reads one of these myth versus fact sheets is they read all the negative stuff first, and then maybe they read the positive stuff. And the positive stuff is always longer and, you know, some big, long, you know, 18 line paragraph, it seems every time, utterly ineffective. So never repeat your opponent's arguments. Uh, next, this is one of the most valuable lessons that I've ever learned in strategic communications, and I use it all of the time when I appear on television, uh, and that is to speak to the value first. Don't speak to the issue first. And let me walk you through what that means. Um, when we're new to politics and we're new to strategic communications, we tend to kind of view issues and ideas and policy and principles and all of that in kind of one big undifferentiated hairball of stuff. And I want to take this opportunity to help you differentiate different layers of that and to break things down onto three levels. And they are values, ideas, and issues. 
values are broadly shared beliefs that people hold, not that politicians value, but that people value. Politicians are notoriously self-centered, uh, self-interested, and everything is got, viewed through a political lens. Think about that. For politicians and people in the political process like us, we tend to view everything through a political lens. Most people do not view things through a political lens. They view it through a practical lens because they are normal, because they're not political people. They, want it, they, are, they are concerned about different things than what politicians are, uh, care about, and they speak in a different language than what politicians speak in. So if you're speaking in terms of millions, billions, you know, trillions, percentages, and acronyms, you're going to sound like a politician. You're, you're not going to be as well connected to your audience. So values are broadly shared. And what, what I mean by broadly, I don't mean 50%. I mean like 80%. And I'll show you some examples of that in just a second. So values are broadly defined. And because they're broadly shared, we're more likely to have those in common with our target audience. So politics is 75% relationships. Relationships are built on things that we have in common. And so if we start our conversation with values that we share, that we can demonstrate to an audience that we are on the same side in terms of valuing this or that, then we're going to be at an advantage. Then, and only then, we can move to a philosophical plane where we start talking about ideas. How do we turn this, this uh, broadly shared value into something that we can advance, that we can have uh, embedded uh, and represented in what it is that we're proposing to do? And then once we do that, then we can talk about the particulars of an issue. And mark my words, I've been involved in politics for 32 years. Most political people want to do the exact opposite particularly when they're new to politics. They want to throw an issue out there and they want to debate it uh, and try to be right rather than get it right. And there's a difference between those two. And when you start with, if you flip this upside down and you do what most political people do, then you start with an issue. We need to privatize social security or we need to sell off all the federal lands uh, or we need to, whatever it is, um, when we start with that, you're going to wind up, what you're doing is you're starting the conversation on something where you, which you have in common with the fewest number of people in the audience, regardless of who it is. And so you're going to alienate half the people in the audience and then try to get them back. And that just doesn't work. It's a prescription for failure. So let me show you two examples about how this can work in terms of speaking to the value first. So let's take a really dull, boring topic like transportation. Uh, and what is a value that we can tie into transportation uh, so that we can connect with people and not sound like some, you know, geek, uh, you know, who talks about, uh, you know, cost per, you know, uh, miles traveled and things like that. Well, one value is time. And the, a value would be that, well, people should be able to have quality time with their family. Now, who would disagree with that? Well, you might say, well, if you don't like grandma, okay. But the vast majority of people who you communicate with will agree people should be able to have quality time with their family. And now you're starting this on this topic with something that the vast majority of people you're communicating with will agree with you on. Well, then we could take it a step further. Now we can bring it down to the ideas level. We can say, well, we should have the shortest commuting time possible uh, in our, in our community so that, uh, a dad can make it home in time for soccer practice so that a mother can make it home in time uh, to, uh, to have dinner with, uh, with her family instead of spending two, three hours a day on the freeway or, uh, or on the subway, et cetera. Another value might be that people should be, people should be safe when they are going to and from work. Everybody would, nobody's going to disagree with that. Well, you can come up with another idea and that, well, how do we improve safety on the subway? or on public transit, et cetera. So start with the value, then move to the idea, and then move to the issue. So an issue might be, and this is just an example, you know, if uh, in my mayoral campaign, if you, if, you know, if we win, we're gonna widen key roads, we're gonna improve key intersections, we're gonna do all the construction that we can at night, so we're not interfering with people's commuting times. So what have I done here? I've taken an obscure issue of transportation policy but I've started with a value and then people now know why I believe what I believe. 
because this goes to what we call the because clause. And that is that we have to define not only what we believe, but why we believe it. And that is something that is usually glossed over by political people because political people are used to talking to other political people all day long, where everybody knows what the benefits are, you know, et cetera, of our ideas. It's assumed what the, what the because is, what the why is. But when we're talking to non-political people, we have to make sure that they understand, well, why do we hold that position? Why do we care about property rights? Why do we care about lower taxes, whatever that is? And that is accomplished by first establishing what the value is. Let's use a second example, and that is of retirement. Uh, and uh, what would be a value related to retirement? Well, every American deserves to retire in dignity. Nobody would disagree with that. The, it, right, left, center, doesn't matter. People of all backgrounds are going to agree that every American deserves to retire in dignity. That's a value. We start with that. We can move that down to the ideas uh, level next by saying, well, Americans are getting a really bad rate of return on, on their social security taxes. And as a result of that, many Americans are not in a position to be able to retire in dignity. Met too many Americans are on track to retire in poverty. And so we have to do something about this because every American deserves to retire in dignity. And then from there, we can bring it down to the issue. And that is, well, maybe we should give some younger workers the option to invest a portion of their social security taxes safely, as they've done in Chile and, and other countries where that's worked well. I guarantee you, particularly if you speak to an older audience, if you flip the order here, and if you start with that issue, you'll alienate the vast majority of people in the room, particularly older people who are much more sensitive to any changes in, uh, in pension funds. Now, here are some common values, and there are many more than I've, than I've included here, but I just wanted to include the sample. Things like my personal health and safety, better relationship with my family, a more satisfying job, being able to afford college for my children, being able to afford travel uh, and leisure time, being able to walk out of my house without wearing a mask. You know, these are values that would be commonly, uh, widely shared, and we should speak to those values first whenever possible. When we're, when we're formulating our message, when we're going out as a communicator for our issue, for our organization, for our candidate, for you know, whatever we're advocating for, there are three components of that. One is to identify what is our top line messaging? What's the main point we wanna get across? Number two, what are some relevant anecdotes or stories that we can use that will reinforce that top line messaging? Because chances are we're going to have to go beyond just the headline. We're going to have to tell some story, use some anecdote, or bring to life uh, and provide credibility to what that top line messaging is. And then thirdly, we want to internalize our, our messages in, in, in a form of a riff. What a, riff, a riff is a term that comes out of the legal field where if we're going to talk about this topic, boom, we know these are our three or four sentences that when I'm going to talk about uh, you know, speed traps on the freeway, I have a riff on that. If we were to talk about lowering the cost for school construction, I've got a riff on that. And the riffs are memorized. And so it's better to give your answers in the form of a riff that you really have no, pretty well formulated in your mind, rather than trying to read from a note card word for word, which tends to be less effective, and you can't really do that in a television uh, context. Let me give a little bit of background on setup and the importance of setup. Um, very often uh, in, a, in, in public policy, in the, in the public policy arena, uh, we're not giving an interview, but we're doing an event where a reporter is covering it. I would say that more than half of the news coverage that we got on the Cruz presidential campaign came from coverage of events rather than one-on-one -on -one interviews. And so therefore, we really care about the setup of presentations. Now, if we uh, if, and uh, if we, if it's our event that we're putting on, then we should have total control over what that looks like. If we're speaking at somebody else's event, we're going to have less control, but we may have some influence. And there are some things that we should keep in mind because we want the setup to put our speaker, whether it's your, yourself personally or your candidate or somebody else, in the strongest possible light, in the best possible uh, position. So I have a, the, the graphic up here is from Jewish National Fund, uh, which is a U.S.-based charity raises $100 million a year, uh, and they really get it right every single time. They have a dedicated event staff. They really know this stuff, uh, and, uh, and all of their events are flawless because they're, they're applying all these best practices. So here are some 
uh, some elements of that. The room setup should put the speaker uh, in control. You as the speaker should be aware, is there a podium? Is there a table? Do you need one? Do you read off of, no or do you use note cards? Do you have a place for them to go, uh, et cetera? Uh, is the seating arranged properly? Like, uh, last year, I lectured at a campaign school in another state, and it was put on by a very well-meaning guy uh, and, uh, and his team, but they did not have experience with putting on trainings. They had experience with putting on meal functions. And so what happened is I walk in, and we're gonna sit for eight hours together in, a, in, in what should be a classroom style, and all the tables are round tables in the room. And that is not how you wanna do a training where you need everyone really facing forward. Because then if you have people sitting at rounds, then no one's gonna sit facing away from the speaker, half the rounds are empty, and it just looks terrible. Uh, and the, the room dynamics are greatly affected and it doesn't really work well. Uh, is the audio set up, is it tested? And mark my words, the devil lives in the audio. In any in-person event, if you're gonna have a problem, it's most likely in the audio. So we need to make sure that we have extra batteries if we're using a wireless or lavalier mic, that it's tested and that there's a backup whenever possible. Then we wanna pay attention to what's behind the speaker because that's gonna influence what do, those, uh, what do those pictures look like. And no empty chairs at the front. Because when you have empty chairs at the front, it's the opposite of this. So here's a picture from uh, a cruise presidential uh, campaign event. This is an event that we controlled and uh, this is set up exactly correctly. So what's right about this picture? Well, the room looks packed. Uh, and uh, if you hold a, uh, an event for 400 people in a room set up for 300 people, it's a huge success. If you hold an event for 300 people in a room set up for 4,000 people, it's a failure, even if you have the same number of people. You'll notice that every single chair at the front is filled. And sometimes it takes effort to get people to, you know, fill in those chairs in the front because then, you know, what if they want to step out, you know, et cetera, they can't really do that. People are reluctant to sit in the front, but you have to make sure that they're up there because, for two reasons. Number one, it's very distracting for the speaker uh, and it will be picked up by the camera. Uh, when a speaker is speaking and the front chairs are empty, it feels like you're speaking to an empty room and people don't want to be there. So for the benefit of the speaker, the front chairs should be filled out. Secondly, when those chairs at the front are empty, it ruins the pictures because from most angles, uh, it's going to look like uh, not enough people turned out for the event. So it has a negative impact on that. So we want to make sure uh, that those uh, front chairs uh, are, uh, are, are filled in. A couple of things for, uh, for interviews. Um, when you're doing an interview, is it in studio or is it on location? Are you gonna be standing or sitting? If you're standing for an interview, don't move. Don't, once you are on camera and you're, and you're speaking or anybody is speaking and the, and the, the tape is rolling, so to speak, uh, don't shift because it's exaggerated on television and it can make you look weird or uncomfortable. At a minimum, it generates a distraction uh, from the audience. Be aware of background noise, uh, what's going on in the background. You don't wanna do an interview where there's a busy street behind you because it could generate vehicular noise, things like that. Is there signage? Are there distractions, wind, air temperature, sun, shade, things like that. Basically, don't repeat this picture. Uh, and this is Mark Molinaro who ran for governor of New York, terrific conservative candidate, super guy, sharp, would make a great governor of New York. This is a terrible setup uh, for his event. So what's wrong with this picture? Well, first, my eye is drawn to these four guys in the back, and I don't know, are they with Mark Molinaro, or are they protesting against Mark Molinaro? I have no idea. There's a, one guy's holding a sign, it says, hey, you know, what, what does that mean? I can't, I can't read it. Next, I notice that the speaker is in the shade. The people behind him are in the sun, but he's in the shade. And then the woman to his left, she looks very unhappy. Uh, and if I'm just looking at this picture, which this picture was pulled from a news article, I'm looking at the candidate, but then I'm looking at someone who's very unhappy next to him. This does not tell a story. Maybe they're in front of a courthouse, maybe they're not, I have no idea, I don't know what's going on. Uh, maybe he's being stalked by four people who just showed up. I don't know what's happening in this picture. So don't follow that. So that's just an example. 
Um, so when it comes to showtime and you're actually doing uh, your interview, here are a couple of techniques to bear uh, in mind. And I'm, I've got to keep this to 15 more minutes, so I've got to run through this a little quickly. But when you're working with television, if you're doing an interview that is being taped to be part of a package, you've got to keep your answers really tight. If it takes you two minutes to tell a story, the entire length of the, news, of, the, of the news package is probably going to be two minutes. You have to be able to give your answers in 10, 15 second sound bites that the reporter can then take and drop into a wider story. So if, if you do the interview and, there, and you're not, and every single thing that you say takes two, three, four minutes, it's not going to be used. If you're doing live, like in studio in a panel discussion or a live interview, then it's a longer format. You have more flexibility there. A couple points on uh, on makeup and the visuals, and this is this applies to guys as well as uh, to gals. Um, so, if you'll notice, um, I have my forehead will just when I'm in the studio will just shine like crazy because I have oily skin here, and I need to carry some translucent powder so that before I go on TV and I'm under those studio lights, I can put the put that translucent powder here, take some of the shine off. Uh, for women. Generally, we're looking for balance. If you know this is uh, you know it, it needs to look professional. It, 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 the makeup should look like you're going to the workplace, not out to a nightclub. Um, don't have earrings that are going to dangle on television because chances are when you talk, they're going to dangle like this, and it's going to be very distracting for the viewer. So studs work better. But in general, with clothing and in makeup, we want to look for balance in all things. When it comes to hair, guys. The less hair you have, the shorter it should be cut. That's the general rule of thumb. So if you're losing it, uh, you know, deal with it effectively uh, and, and handle it graciously. But the, sh the, the more hair you've lost, the shorter your haircut should be. Um, the longer your hair winds up being, it just accentuates things and it's not a good look. Um, a well-trimmed beard can be effective. Gosh, look at Senator Cruz who grew a beard after, the pre after his campaign. Uh, and, uh, and it's been hugely effective. I mean, everyone, you know, noted, uh, even people on the left that, you know, the, the beard works well for him. So good for him. Uh, for women, a natural look looks more flattering. If it looks overly, you know, eighties, uh, then that's probably not going to work well. And the reason why the advice here is to leave some, if you have bangs, to leave some gap between where your hair ends and your eyebrows, it's because studio lighting will generate a shadow. And if that shadow then falls over your eyes, it, it, it looks weird. It generates a distraction uh, on TV. When you're dressing for a presentation, uh, generally, the general rule of thumb is to aim one step above the people who you expect to see. So um, that means that if you're, in a, if you're in a professional setting, then you want to look you know, particularly sharp. Uh, if you are going to go you know, tour a ranch, uh, then you know, you're going to be in, uh, you know, in blue jeans and a, you know, and a, and a shirt, uh, probably not a jacket, uh, you know, but uh, boots that are, you know, nice and clean and so on. Just one step above whatever context you're going to wind up being in. And the reason for that has nothing to do with being above anybody. The reason why we dress one step above who we expect to meet is that it's a sign of respect to them. It's a sign of respect to the audience. The reason I'm wearing a jacket and tie is a sign of respect to you. And so when speakers show up and they're poorly dressed and they just, you know, threw on, you know, some, you know, ratty golf shirt or whatever, and I've seen this happen very often, it's a sign, it's a lack of respect for the audience. So we want to show respect to the audience uh, by, uh, by looking like we put some effort uh, into our presentation. Posture. If you are sitting, so I'm in an office chair in my home office uh, here in the People's Democratic Republic of California. And I am leaning forward, even though this chair is a high back chair. And the reason I'm leaning forward is that if I lean back or if I just lean, and you'll, I'll do it in just a second, the camera is going to exaggerate it. So notice the difference between how I'm sitting now, which is leaning forward at about a 10, 15 degree angle, versus if I sit like this, the camera has exaggerated and it looks like I'm not engaged. It looks like I'm you know, here to listen to, to you know, someone else and pass judgment on them or whatever. But we want to lean forward and, and look like we are engaged in the conversation that we're present uh, in the moment. And don't do any of these things. 
Don't play with rings, coins in your pocket. Don't touch anything. Don't touch your face. Don't scratch anything. I mean, we found kind of Joe Biden here. Look at this poor woman on the left side of the screen here. Don't do any of those things because it's, it's simply distracting uh, for the audience. If you are on television or giving a presentation, don't touch anything up here. When you're working with radio, a couple of things to keep in mind here. Uh, radio interviews in the field are just like television. So if a radio reporter has a microphone, they're, they're going to tape an interview with you and then use segments of it uh, in a package later, then your answers have to be tight as well. But if you're in a long format, like in a, on an hour-long radio show, then you can you know, go a little longer. But just bear in mind that we have to, even in a long format, don't allow yourself to get too distracted. Don't go down every, you know, every cul-de-sac, et cetera. Uh, we want to always keep in mind what we call message discipline. Get, a po get across the main points that you want to get across and don't pass up that opportunity. Think in terms of responding to questions instead of just answering questions. And what's the difference? An answer is an answer. A response is an answer plus what you want to get across. When you're calling in uh, to a radio show, um, stand up. The audience, you will project more energy if you're standing up and, and whether you're standing up or walking around or not, but you'll be more energetic. Use a landline whenever possible and avoid doing radio interviews while you're driving in the car. Number one, you should not do a radio interview while you're the person driving uh, because half of your uh, mental bandwidth is going to be consumed with driving and not the interview itself, and you want to be 100% focused on that. And second, if you're on a cell phone, uh, chances are you, know, you, you run the risk of moving out of cell range and then getting, uh, and then getting cut off. Um, you can use vocals to evoke emotion. That's how we connect with an audience on an emotional level, using vocals. And you can see on the screen here, if, we're, if we speak louder, we can convey uh, anger, outrage, or alarm. If we speak slower, we can convey calm and understanding. And the best way to get really good at this is through practice. Uh, the, uh, the more, whether you join a Toastmasters club or you, know, or you get involved you know, in campaigns as a surrogate speaker, et cetera, take every opportunity to do more and more public speaking because you'll just, you'll just be strengthened here. Look at how uh, emphasizing a different word in the same sentence changes the entire meaning of that sentence. Do not begin sentences with so. Uh, famously, Mark Zuckerberg, who basically we can call him just the owner of Facebook, uh, gave an interview, I think, with Wired Magazine, where every single answer that he gave began with so. It comes across like you're lecturing people. And if you're younger, you might be more prone to something called uptalk. Uptalk is where we end every sentence where it sounds like a question. Um, I work for the Leadership Institute. Uh, I'm really glad to be with you today. It, it sounds like you are seeking approval or you are asking a question uh, when you speak in uptalk. And this undermines your credibility. And for those of you who might engage in that, there's a really quick technique that you can use to get yourself out of that. Write out a sentence, like what you see here. And on the last word, write an up arrow on the first syllable and a down arrow on the second syllable. So instead of I work at Google, it's I work at Google, I work at Microsoft, and that will put an end to that and will really improve um, uh, how you're perceived in terms of your command of the subject matter. Let me run through uh, quickly here how we respond to questions, and there are four different types of questions, open, closed, leading, and speculative. Uh, and open-ended questions are just like that, it's like an essay. Tell me how you became a delegate. How did you become a, get involved in politics? Why do you think this issue is important? What do you think of Black Lives Matter? Can President Trump win in Arizona? That's an open-ended question. A closed question is where you're basically confined in what your response can be. Where are you from? Are you married? Do you have pets? How old are you? You know, yes, no, or simple answers. When you're responding to open and closed-ended questions, um, these are really the easiest, by far, questions to answer in an interview uh, context. When you're dealing with closed questions, are you married? How many kids do you have? When did you first get involved in politics? Keep it tight. 
Not every question requires an, you know, an essay. Um, and you'll have that opportunity when it comes to other questions. But very, generally, when you're getting closed questions, um, you are, the reporter is just trying to get some basic information. And then once they have that, then you know, there'll be other questions that, that, uh, that come along with that. When you're dealing with open questions, maintain your focus. Remember what the key points are that you want to get across. Provide an answer, but provide your answer. And then include in that. The, that top line messaging, which, which you think is so uh, important to get across. If, remember, if you don't say it, a reporter can't say that you said it, which is why you should always tape record your interviews. A reporter is probably tape recording it, and you should tape record it as well. It's not seen as something that's hostile, but it's, it, it, in the Cruz campaign, there were many times when we recorded interviews, and we're glad that we did because someone got it wrong. We were able to get it uh, corrected. There are leading questions. Uh, and, uh, you know, why do you oppose women rights, women's rights? Why do you hate cute puppies? Uh, and when you get these leading questions, here's how to respond. Don't get mad at the reporter. Keep calm. Maintain respect for the reporter and challenge the premise of the question. If you get a leading question that has a premise built in, don't feel that you have to respond from the box that you've just been placed in. You jump out of the box, and the way you do that is by by uh, questioning the premise of the question. Finally, hypothetical questions are, are usually designed to generate news where none exists. So we had a great candidate for governor in 2010 here in California, Meg Whitman, very accomplished Silicon Valley executive making her first run for office, but it was her first run for office. She was not experienced. She signed an anti-tax pledge, which was the right thing to do. Uh, and then you had a reporter uh, who asked her, well, you know, what if there was a natural disaster, like an earthquake or a tsunami? Would you be open to raising taxes then? That's a, that is a speculative question, and it's asked in a way so that the reasonable person will feel some pressure to give the answer the reporter is looking to hear. And unfortunately, Mrs. Whitman said, oh, well, you know, I guess in, you know, in, a, in a natural disaster situation, you know, she would be open to it. What's the headline? Whitman hedges on her pledge to raise taxes, to not raise taxes. And if you just look at the wording which Shane Goldmacher, who was then with the LA Times used, um, look at the last, the, the, the third paragraph here. Whitman's misstep highlights the headaches such absolutist promises can bring on the campaign trailer in office. Look at these words, misstep, headache, absolutist, right? So, when you're, the proper way to handle a speculative question is to not speculate. But don't engage in speculation. Don't engage in hypotheticals, et cetera. You, you know, we can just say, look, we're not gonna get into speculation here, uh, but the, the important point here is that the people of California are overtaxed, they're overregulated, it's driving people out of the state, it's breaking up middle-class families because kids can't afford to raise their, uh, the uh, people, adults can't afford to raise their kids here in California. And the last thing we are gonna do is make that tax burden worse, especially if there's a natural disaster. The last thing we're gonna do to the taxpayer is make the situation worse by raising their taxes. So here's a summary open-ended, closed-ended questions, leading questions, and speculative. And here's a summary of the responses uh, that I just worked through. Final point, because I've got two minutes left, work relentlessly to minimize distractions. Here's an example, George Allen, senator from Virginia running for re-election, called uh, a tracker, someone who was following him around and videotaping him at events. He called him this word, which I don't even know what this word means, but it was not good. And for the whole final weeks of the campaign, that's all anyone was talking about, uh, and he lost. This was a, quite a distraction on the Cruz campaign. We put together this great ad beating up on Marco Rubio at the time, and it turned out that the casting agency didn't bet everybody involved, and it turned out that we had a porn star in one of our commercials. Don't let that happen. The lesson here is be aware of people who you affiliate with. Uh, because even though this person was an actor who was hired to be in an ad, did this wind up generating news and distraction. And then finally, when there is something problematic to deal with, be prepared to deal with it. Here's Elizabeth Warren's uh, you know, card here uh, from uh, the State Bar, written in her own handwriting, claiming that she's an American Indian. Elizabeth Warren is as much of an American Indian as I am, which is that she's not. So... That's, uh, that is about 90 minutes worth of material I ran through in about 60 minutes. 
So I'm gonna turn it back over to our hosts. I hope that that was uh, of, uh, of interest to you. Uh, we can prov if you provide us with your email address, uh, we will provide you with a copy of the presentation in PowerPoint uh, format. So if you send an email uh, to me, uh, and my email address is ron at ronnearing.com. I should have had it on the screen, I don't. But it's ron at ronnearing.com. We'll send you a PDF of the presentation and you can use that uh, as a reference document. So there we go. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, I hope that was helpful and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks to everyone who attended and is helping to organize. Thank you so much, Ron. Um, I really wish that I'd heard your presentation before I tried speaking at this conference. Um, I'm sure that I would have done quite a bit better. Um, I've seen things where I can definitely improve and um, yeah, hope to take advantage of this in the future. Um, yeah, uh, it doesn't look like we have time for questions, so I'm going to go ahead and just close us down. Uh, but thank you so much. Um, yeah. Everyone else benefited as much as I did. Thank you very much. We'll see thank you the next you. time.